Traders Live podcast. Hello and welcome to the Traders Live podcast, episode number one. I am one half of your co-host. My name is Chergers and with me today is Marto. Marto, how are you? Mr. Chergers, very well, mate. You? Very well, very well. Episode number one, our guest today is none other than yourself. Right. Um, only ways up, eh? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's our thinking exactly. We'd set the bar low. Listen, <laughs> we we have a great episode coming up. What I really want to talk about with you is how you trade your transition from, obviously we know each other a bit now, your transition from your working and business life into the venture that is trading, how you go about your strategy and, and all the nuts and bolts in between to what makes you you and what allows you to execute on the market. So really, really for, looking forward to that. And I guess the, the introduction to Traders Live podcast is through none other than the niche that is how we're going to run it. And that is we're going to get our guests to trade live. So are you up for the challenge? Bring it, mate. I'm ready. Good, good. And and this, the great part about having you as our first guest is that we also set the bar really low for every other guest. <laughs> <laughs> what have we got? We got 20, 20 grand to spend. So um, yeah, that, that could go quickly. Yep, yep, that's right. So you're really lucky. We're giving you a lot of advantage. We're giving <laughs> you the pre-market here today. Uh, that opens in about two minutes. It's probably good to note for our audio listeners that are on, you know, one of the great uh, Spotify, Apple, whatever it is. We also do post this to YouTube, which will allow you to look at what Mardo is trading in real time as we go through the podcast. We'll do our best to always sort of guide you through the audio only version on, on what is happening on a day, but it's, it's there to view if you want. And I think the great part about what we're doing here with trading live is that, listen, we're not, we're not coming out to prove or disprove these great traders who have these bold claims, because frankly, we're giving everyone an hour time up, which I'm going to start right now because I saw you putting some limit orders on. Mm -hmm. I know it's a minute to pre-market, but I'm going to put that on. And yeah, as I was saying, we're not trying to prove or disprove a certain trader. We're not trying to out someone for not being able to trade. It is a great way for us to see inside the mind of people like yourself, Mato, and, and the other guests that we have on and really see how they tick and encourage some dialogue about, about what's going on. Yeah, I think it's a pretty unique uh, kind of proposition, mate. And we, yeah, we kind of thought, what's the best way to get inside um, some really good traders' minds? And I think doing it live is probably a a really unique kind of way to do that and um, get get them to kind of talk through exactly what they're thinking and why they're doing certain things. So um, yeah, as we just uh, just about to open, mate. So I'll just uh, get rid of one of these orders when it goes off, <clears throat> or both of them. So Mato here is trading with $20,000 in Unreal funds. We're using a demo account for this challenge. And essentially every podcast is going to have Mato or a guest or whoever it is trade live for an hour with $20,000. And it's almost, we compare this to sort of Top Gear where they used to do the hot lap around the track and, and put everyone on a leaderboard. It's not for keeps. We're not playing for sheep stations. We're, we're just exactly having a look inside the minds of traders and who knows we i there's some really interesting people out there that talk about psychology and mindset and i'm really interested to get those sort of people on and talk to them and you know what have them in front of front of the market and just see what they do and it's all for a bit of fun it's yes we're putting you on a leaderboard the only person i'm taking seriously is yourself uh so it's gonna be great all right bring it mate i um so I, I realize just uh, just at open here that um, we're obviously using a demo account which has uh, retail uh, kind of margin requirements. So that's uh, that's thrown a bit of a spanner in the works for my YOLO trade. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll see how we, see how we progress. Yep. So we are what a minute into pre market here, and you have been sort of you've laid in forty units now. The markets dropped what 10 points in pre-market and That's i'm just curious as to over the next hour what what approach are you taking here talk us through your strategy 
All right, so today, mate, it's um, it's probably a good kind of opportunity um, whereby um, I guess my training strategy is, you know, obviously I've built a very large historical data set um, and I've spent a couple of years kind of getting to know, I guess, how to, to put to bring that data to life as you know, wanky as it sounds. But um, uh, so what I generally kind of am looking for, I'm looking for kind of outliers, some volatility, um, some kind of event um, that I can kind of hang my hat on and put a box around in terms of the, the potential outcome. So, um, so I guess today, when I look at today, we've got CPI tomorrow. So, you know, does the day before it's CPI kind of act a certain way? We've got retail sales. Do retail, you know, do, do those days act a certain way? And then obviously we had that large fall yesterday. So, um, you know, following a, you know, what were we, 65 point futures fall yesterday, um, does the market, you know, act a certain way the day after. So I guess when I'm going through my spreadsheet, um, they're kind of the, you know, for today, for instance, they're the three kind of scenarios that I'm looking at. Um, And then I dig into, you know, I'll go through each of those. Um, You know, is there a trend? Is there, if there is a trend, um, you know, can I set my risk management at an appropriate level um, for a kind of reasonably high risk reward kind of probability? And then if that's um, ticked off, um, then that kind of um, shapes the trading that I'm doing. So I guess in, uh, if you want me to kind of talk through this particular instance, um, you know, I look at, let's see, just bring some of this stuff up, but um what have we got here so day before <laughs> kind of cpi if i have a look at that nothing too that stands out to me a great deal apart from it's generally um probably a bit bit longer tail to the upside um but nothing that i can really use just on the face it, of it there um looking at retail sales uh that's normally a a big nothing with um, a couple of decent outliers, but um, generally just single digit kind of moves from open to close. And then the interesting one for me is that move yesterday where we got the 60.4. Um, so following big drops on Monday, we generally get um, a bit of a, a refresh back up um, the next day on the Tuesday. So if I'm looking here and I probably can't see this quite at the moment, but um we do get uh quite a move higher um on the overwhelming kind of uh, number of cases so yeah um that's kind of what i'm what i'll be looking to kind of target today with uh if i look at the the moves today low 25 points seems to be the kind of cut off there so that's what i'll be um i guess my downside that's what i'll be looking at yeah yeah okay so it sounds like you're approaching this our challenge here today quite similarly to how you approach your normal day-to-day trading which is really really good um a lot of traders that we bring on might be swing traders they might trade equities they they could have a vast different uh i guess ways of approaching the market so it's important to know that not everyone who comes on the podcast will be able to trade exactly how they like but Again, we're not playing for sheep stations, but it is going to be great insight this morning to see how you trade just as you would any other day. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. So we're about five minutes into pre-market here. You've got your two hundred and twenty dollars under your name. Let's see. If we can, <laughs> let's see if you can keep it, or we're Mate, we'll I went, watch something I, spectacular. I went for, it was involved. meant to be four hundred contracts, so I've um, unfortunately got uh, strangled by the uh, the retail margins, but. Uh, Anyway, that's that's all right. We're in the we're in the we're in the green, mate. So that's a yeah, good yeah. Start. All right. Well, let's move on to a little bit more about yourself. Obviously, we've been friends for some while now, but I think you have a really interesting story, and I really want to get into sort of some of your early career and early life and learn a little bit more about that. So, can you talk to talk to me about your first beginnings in in work and life and and how you think that that sort of shaped you and what you were sort of doing. Were you in the industry? Were you trading? What What is your come up? 
Yeah, I suppose um, like probably start with uh, with my parents and they were both uh, kind of entrepreneurs in their own right. You know, they own nursing homes, um, took a lot of risk, you know, had to make it through the uh, the recession we had to have with whatever they were, 18% interest rates with business loans. You know, they talk about, uh, you know, feeding me sausages every night and not, uh, not eating because um, they couldn't afford it at the time. So... Um, yeah, so I guess they're probably a little bit of a, an inspiration from that point of view, and I've probably followed in that probably risk-taking um, entrepreneurial kind of uh, lifestyle. But um, yeah, grew up, uh, Ashgrove did um, a few odd jobs. I, I was thinking actually um, this morning that my first couple of jobs, I think, were a a petrol station att uh, attendant, which I got a trial for, and I ended up spilling petrol all over someone's shoe, so they didn't ask me back. And um, and a cafe as well, where I think I spilt a um, a drink over someone, so again didn't ask me back. So um, probably uh, not not the best uh, person to speak to about that. But um, yep. yeah, uh, then yeah, uni bachelor econ commerce, which gave me a, yep. a really good foundation actually at school while we're on it um did econ and absolutely loved it so anyone i speak to <clears throat> about you know they have kids going into high school that's probably the one subject that i just encourage them to to for the kids to you know get exposure to because it's um yeah for, for me it just shapes the way that i look at absolutely everything in life now and i i um thank my uh my high school economics teacher you know significantly in that that regard and i'm trying to pass that on to my kids as well yeah yeah so did your economics teacher particularly shape your high school outcome or give you any particular insight or, or guidance through that period or did you just really enjoy the economic subject I enjoyed it mate and it was yeah, yeah he was a he was an older gent and he just had a passion for economics but um yeah it's strange it's it's the one thing in life i think that has you know it changes the lens that you view everything through whether you you know getting a medium uh you know big mac meal at maccas or you're um you know trading millions of dollars it's um it really gives you you know a certain perspective on um on how you see things yeah yeah so out of uni you couldn't work at a petrol station you couldn't work at a cafe so where where did you go what did you end up doing uh mate i did um sorry i'll just do this one um I did, I went into uh, managing hotels. Um, okay. So I, I managed a couple of them, um, met my wife at one, um, which, you know, could, was a fork, fork in a road, road, I suppose, one way or the other, but um, but uh, turned out very well for me. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I guess, being part of that, um, you know, moving to a, a managerial role, I guess it just kind of confirmed to me that, you um, that that was the, the kind of path that I was going to take. I really didn't enjoy working for anyone else. Um, sorry, I'll just place another trade here. So talk me through, what are you doing here? Just adding to your longs? Yeah, adding to longs. So, um, I, and it's a little bit tricky because I'm, try, I'm trying to kind of work out on the fly in terms of position sizes. Um, sure. You know, I've obviously got 2.8 to trade here um, with a 25-point stop, so I've got no trying to work out in my brain with these this number of positions. I think I got 50 contracts, um, whether I'm going to get liquidated before my stop or not. But um, obviously in the in the real world, you'd, um, you'd have a bit better idea of, um, you know, your leverage ratios and yep. where you get stopped out there. But yeah, essentially I'm looking at um, uh, the outcomes in terms of when Monday we have a decent fall uh, and I'm looking at, so we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six kind of outcomes out of out of thirteen here that have less than ten points to day low. Yep. So I guess in my in my brain, I'm going. Um, I'm almost thinking of that I'm going to be trading two different or three different strategies. So right. one one is that. Um, I guess the YOLO trade in terms of like there's a there's a reasonable um, probability that we're going to rally from open like within reason um, less than ten points to low so I want to have a decent position size to take advantage of that um, 
Sorry, I've got to actually trade on my real account while I'm talking to you as well and not just play money. Yeah, yeah. So the market's opened now for probably two minutes. You've got 50 contracts on. All seem to be in the money. It's interesting to hear that you, you're you not looking at where the market is relative to the candles before. It's sort of just all channeled through that data set and the box that you trade around. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of, I split it up in my brain going, okay, I want a decent position in case it rallies from open because it's a reasonable probability that it, you know, will drop, you know, it won't move less than 10 points before rallying. And Sorry, then just to quickly interrupt yeah. there, the decent probability on a rally on open, is that given to you because of the pre-market move or because of the day's expectancy from previous sessions? Uh, yesterday's session. Okay, thank you. So that's telling me, um, giving me a box to work in for today. Great. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of that that I've got in the back of my mind. And then the fallback is <clears throat> uh, with a lot of these other scenarios was that it fell, you know, more than 10 points, but kind of rallied back over the day to kind of finish, say, even. So that's kind of the second scenario in my brain that, well, if that plays out, I'm probably going to stop out on my open trade because that was kind of, the intention of that was to capture um, a significant move. Um, so if it drops more than 10 points, that kind of hypothesis is out the door. So then I kind of go to the second one, which is, um, you know, that kind of dip and come back to open. Um, in that case, you know, I trade that a certain way. So I might, even though I stop it, I might stop out of my, <clears throat> my open long, um, I might actually take a, a long position exactly where I stopped out, which might sound... A little bit strange but it's yeah. kind of, um you know, i've kind of got two two things going on in my brain and okay then, so i can trade that and then the third um scenario i guess is that i'm completely fucking wrong and then i'll get stopped out at um uh yeah where i set my stop at 25 which i think that that 25 point kind of buffer um captures uh like you know 95 percent of the past yep. appearances so if it goes through that <clears throat> i'm i'm way out yeah so you in your real trading place hard stops all the time on your positions yeah yep and those hard stops are based on the data set that you have and the probability of uh the indice that you're trading falling a certain amount yeah so that's that's the first thing that i look at i look at um, how am I going to get out of this trade without blowing up my account? So, yeah. Okay. No, great. So, so far we've seen a bit more of a rally on open here. We're now sort of four minutes, five minutes into market trade. You, you're $890 in the green again. It's not, it's not profit until it's banked. But... <laughs> yeah. What are we, what are we moved here? 92 to 02. So we moved about 10 points. Yeah, so we do we do have a good opening drive, which is falling into Mato's thesis at the moment. Switching back to your earlier life, you've managed a few hotels. Where where is this path taking me? Where are we going next? Uh, then it was to ANZ, mate, ANZ corporate or business banking, then corporate. Um, so that's a that's one of Australia's big four banks, correct? That's the big four. Yep, and um, yeah, a decent place to kind of work at lots of great people but um yeah it's pretty clear to me that that was never going to be in my um yeah in my in my destiny i couldn't i couldn't stand a working for working for people probably b all the you know the corporate corporate wank and um right. see the uh kind of the clock in clock out kind of culture in terms of yeah you know you could get could get there at five in the morning but um you get dirty looks on the way out at three o'clock so that didn't really um kind of sit with my my upbringing so um yeah so that was just a, a kind of means to to an end i suppose did you find the work there challenging and it was just the culture and that that mundane personalities things like that struggling or or was it a, a sort of a mix of everything oh yeah it was challenging but it's uh, like as you know mate it, if you're doing something that you don't have a passion for it's um it's pretty pretty sluggish um to go along the way and and definitely now looking back as well i mean there's obviously some great bankers out there but i think a lot of 
you know, having run a business now um, and been on both sides of the coin, um, I kind of have a chuckle looking back at, um, you know, how we used to sit there and kind of pretend that we knew what business owners were talking about and what they're right. kind of, what kept them up at night and all the rest of it. I mean, we, yeah, we, we, um, we were trained as to what we th- we think that they you know that they wanted and what they needed but um until you've kind of actually got your hands dirty on the other side you've, you've got no idea yeah okay and so if you were to have your time again rewind the clock back you're out of uni let's say you've still you've still done the hotels would you go banking again would you still work for a big corporate for a few years what what is your thoughts around that yeah, I think so. I think you get, I think you get a lot, a lot of out of it. I'm not too sure what. Um, I'd have to think about <laughs> yeah. that one. But uh, but I think yeah, just the I guess the camaraderie. You know, I don't think you can. It's probably a bit tough to go straight out of kind of uni into a entrepreneurial kind of gig, which I'm sure a lot of people do. But um, if that's your thing, but um, yeah, I think it's a you know you obviously have the social aspect. Like um, yeah, had a lot of good times um you know with knock off knock off drink drinks and you know it was kind of you know strutting around in in your suit in uh in the cbd and things like that that was you know good fun but um but yeah i, I think it teaches you a few things i think it's a good leading whether it's a you know accountancy firm or a, a bank or you know well, it obviously depends what you're um what you're doing but um like my business partner's an accountant he did the so that was kind of um you know the, our yin and yang um banks and, and accountancy so uh yeah interesting yep and so then you you left banking can you and then you went and started your own business is that the next step in your journey yeah we um i kind of obviously it was just getting a little bit you know i was getting to the stage where i'd you know um kind of roll in it roll in at nine go for a coffee come back uh go for breakfast come back go for lunch, come back, and then it was nearly time to go home. So okay. um, I wasn't really uh, kind of <laughs> enjoying it all that much. But, oh, you uh, just picture you just, <laughs> just rolling from one. You just line up maybe five or ten 30-minute coffees with different yeah. people. Yeah, and... oh, man, it's all networking, isn't it? Sure. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we oh, I was obviously getting itchy feet, and um, so me and uh, a mate were looking for something to kind of sink our teeth into. Um, and the only thing that kind of ticked the box was a, a kind of food and drink wholesale distributor out in Warwick, which is a couple of hours uh, west of Brizzy. Um, so that's a that's a regional town, essentially. Yeah, for, for yep. those who aren't familiar. Yeah, yeah, I think um, oh, what is it twenty maybe twenty thousand people something like that now. Um, so yeah, we just kind of bought a house at the time. Uh, I had a boy that was uh, just just recently born um but yeah it just it was just you know time i just took the plunge i guess um everything kind of lined up um so we did but that's that's one of these things i mean how many how many times do you hear people say um you know oh when this happens and this happens then the time will be right i mean there is no there is no good time to kind of make tough decisions and that's that was definitely um one that uh i'm very lucky that my my wife supported me uh in that but um yeah it was a it was a kind of a, a hard time to be picking up and moving uh everything you know three hours away to a strange town to a a business that uh when i'd never run one before um in an industry that i had no idea about so yeah oh wow okay there's obviously a lot of questions i could be asking here around your time in business can you Quickly, just remind me, how long did you have your your business for in Warwick? Uh, I think it was about seven years, seven or eight years. So yeah, okay. I, I, kinda, yeah. I often think about, um, I think it's Reid Hoffman from LinkedIn, and he talks about, you know, tours of duty. So, you know, I think of, for me, I had like a, um, you know, banking was about seven or eight years, uh, tour of duty, and then, uh, running my own business seven or eight years and then I've obviously had a few years off and I think this next kind of stage with what you know with what we're doing um will probably yeah, take me out the next seven 
Um, so it's a, yeah, I just think it's a good kind of time period to really sink your teeth into something, be successful, um, but then don't kind of overstay your welcome. Yeah. Okay. And did you sort of turn that business around? Did you inherit a good business? Did you just build the business and then, um, spoiler, you, you ended up selling that to a multinational, correct? But what, what, what was that journey? Did you inherit a bad business and, and have to learn to turn that around? Did you just organically grow it? What was your strategy? It was a really good business. It was a niche um, uh, distributed in school uh, canteens, actually, which was interesting. But um, so it would you would distribute the the items used in in the school, like canteens and tuck yeah. shops. Yeah. Yep. So I think of anything anything that you find in a tuck shop, from uh, from chicken burgers to the packaging to the drinks to the ice blocks um, and everything in, in between. So it's really good. Don't see much of that anymore, mate. It's all health food. It's all ah, Yeah, I know. Is that, that right? That's, yeah. that's the way that they were going, yeah. We, Back we in managed, my day. Yeah, we managed to sneak sneak a few things in there. But, um, um, but yeah, no, it was a good business and it was super niche, uh, which really pe- appealed to me. So it was kind of, um, you know, it wasn't on their own. Obviously, those canteens aren't big enough for the big guys to kind of worry about. But when you're doing 100 or 120 or whatever we did, of them, um, you know, you could um, margins were probably five times industry average. So, um, so it was good from that point of view. But um, yeah, kind of a, a shot. It was a good business, and then I took over. Um, and one of the big, big kind of lessons out of it, and this is embarrassing coming from banking, but I was so focused on the sales for the first couple of months that I kind of forgot about forgot about debtors. Um, so we got a a few months in, I was, you know, pretty happy with how sales were going, um, but we had no, we had no cash. Obviously, our working capital was just um, decimated because we hadn't been collecting any money. So, um, which was, which was, uh, yeah, as I said, a bit, bit embarrassing. But, um, but yeah, that that was a really good lesson. Um, obviously, learned a lot on the way. But um, yeah, we we took a really big hit the first probably six or twelve months. Um, just obviously, when you're uh a young guy coming you know youngish um taking over a business that you 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 know know nothing about you get every every competitor sorry um every (laughs) yeah that's right um attacking you and kind of um trying to trying to put you out of business so we had a rough probably first year and then had to kind of um build back up from there but we ended up yeah i think um you know we ended up doubling turnover over that period um which probably doesn't sound like uh, a great deal but it's a pretty pretty cutthroat industry and you've got to work um pretty hard to kind of take market share off um every other man and his dog so yeah so we did did well uh kind of in in the end and as you said um kind of transitioned a, a sale to um one of the bigger competitors that we had yeah okay there's probably a thousand lessons that you've learned during that time and you know i see this on so many other podcasts with traders or entrepreneurs and everything like that and they they talk about that seven year tour that they did and very much brush over you know yeah took the business and did this but i mean when you are in that business every day for seven years and you you've just moved your family to this rural area you are you've got you've got a you know a fresh small child there that you you've left this stable corporate job can you just talk to me about getting through that time of i guess was there uncertainty and talking about that time of uncertainty where you must just you must have had those days where you're going what what am i doing why i should have just stayed the corporate route i should have just provided well for my family for the next x amount of years and not have had this stress what what in the trenches what was that like uh yeah it's pretty pretty full on now that you haven't thought about it thanks chokes for bringing that up but um yeah it was uh a real kind of roller coaster as silly as it you know sounds but um yeah you can go from being over the moon that you kind of secured a, a new client in the morning to being depressed and just want to curl up in a ball um in the afternoon and and that happened many many times and and there were kind of periods that I would probably, um, I'm not a big believer in, um, you know, labeling things, but, uh, but yeah, I'd probably say that I was depressed at, 
at different times. And yeah, as you say, mate, you're just like, I was just thinking, what the hell have I done? You know, I had a cushy, cushy job paying decent money. And now I'm, um, you know, trying to scratch out, um, coin, um, in what I'm doing now. So, um, yeah, but I guess you, you know, I went through a bit of a, um, a Tony Robbins phase as well through that mate. And, uh, did, did my um, gratitude and meditation every morning. So that, that kind of, kind of helped along the way as well. Yep. Yep. And did that, um, did that time period for you give you a lot of transferable skills to trading in a strategy framework or a mindset framework? Do you, do you think there's a lot of transferables there between running a business and then I guess in a way you're running a business now with your trading? So what's, what are the similarities between those two ventures? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say it's more around mindset, mate, that just, you know, discipline and, and ability to take risks. I mean, that can not always um, be a good thing, but, <clears throat> um, you know, risk mitigation as well. But, um, yeah, I'm not sh- not sure how many similarities there are, but um, definitely, yeah, I guess to the ability to, to kind of get knocked down and get, get up again is, is probably pretty central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, we coming back to your trading challenge now. We're what we're 17, 20 minutes into the the regular trading hours session. You've got the one hour time frame chart up, and you've just scrolled up because there's just a, a straight <laughs> green bar on the one hour time frame. I I really hope that, that that our next guest just comes and blows you out of the water because you should not have whatever <laughs> ranking you have on our leaderboard. You should just not have. Um, well, we, we, what have we done? Thirty points in fifteen minutes. Um, so. I should probably I should probably be thinking about um taking some profit now instead of talking to you mate but um maybe, maybe I'll just I'll be a a little bit um conservative here and just lock lock some profit away. So what I'm what I'm probably looking at now we've just clicked over the 15 minutes so um and that was I'll just change the time frame on here. We've got 92 to 12 so at a 20 20 point first 15 minutes. So if I look at so again, at this point, I'm going back into my data. So I'm just going to take some profit in another account as well. <laughs> Doing both at once. I love it. Um, so yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at all the other days where we've rallied greater than 15 points following a futures drop the previous day. And I'll just look at it without that. Um, so when I look at that, <clears throat> it's probably not that much more room to kind of move looking at history. There's a few outliers a little bit higher, but, um, but the, probably the, you know, if you had to kind of pick something, um, we're probably, there's more downside than upside from kind of this point on, I would say. So, um, so I'm doing a few things. I'm looking at kind of the day high of those days, how far, they went higher. Um, what's the average there? Average is 37 points, which is what 92 to so what have we done? Uh, 40 odd points. So, so we might have, yeah, a little bit more to go, but, um, it's probably not a bad time to start yeah, taking a little bit of profit. Yeah. Okay. So my understanding is you've got a day type, you've essentially got all of your data, you filter your day types based on previous sessions. And that gives you an expectancy within, you'd obviously have a standard deviation of days, but not a standard deviation, but a bell curve of days that could potentially play out in the morning. You trade based on that. Talk to me about when you exit, are you exiting when you are, you know, one standard deviation up in terms of uh, expectancy for the day in range or do you try and play to those upper bounds, the extremes, the the outliers in your data? Where do you choose to have those exit conditions based on the, I guess, the range of data set, the range of data points that you have in your data set? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think I've learned over the years to uh, not be too greedy and just start um, taking profits along the way. Um, so 
yeah, whether it's every 10 points or whatever, yeah, again, it depends on what the data is telling me. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll normally look for, if my hypothesis is playing out, I'll, I'll start taking profit at probably the minimum um, point of that range. So like if today, for instance, if, you know, looking at that 15 minute move, if the smallest move to day high was, you know, 25 points, um, I'd start taking profit at that point at 25 points above. Um, and then, you know, if the maximum move was 70 points and we're getting towards 70 points, that's where I'd, you know, want to be completely kind of closed out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. So you've now scaled back. I think you had 50, 60 units at one point this morning. Yeah. Uh, 50 or 60. Yeah. Something like yeah, that. Yeah. And you've now scaled that back. You're just carrying the remaining 20 that you got in at the low of pre-market essentially. Talk to me. Are you just going to close that out when we get a bit more of a drive or when you see a pullback, where are you going to add if anywhere? Well, I've got to, I've got to close it out in the next, um, what? You got 26 minutes. 26 minutes. Don't I? So, um, so again, what are we looking at? 40 points, um, day high average was about 38. Um, so yeah, I'll probably just carry it, um, for the purposes of, um, of this, but, um, yeah, generally I'd, yeah, I'd leave a little bit of run. I'd probably close out maybe an, another five here and then just start closing out above. Um, I really wish we had um, checked this demo, mate, so that we could have traded um, the 400 contracts I was trying to get, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Everyone else will be trading the exact same <laughs> size. They're not going to get away from you. Don't All worry. Right. It's very, um, yeah, very responsible what we're doing anyway. So, yeah, that's some good, um, good tight tight leverage control. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we should be promoting. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> I'm trying to get 400 contracts. <laughs> So you've had, you've had this period of six, seven years where you've built this business, you've got the exit, you've sold to a multinational, you've obviously collected a bit of money through that sale process. Are you diving straight into the next thing? What are you doing after you've, you've finally achieved this goal that you've essentially been working at for seven years? Yeah, so we um, we always want to live uh, by the beach, so for a few years at least. So we moved down the Gold Coast to Palm Beach, um, beautiful unit kind of overlooking the beach. So yeah, did that for three years. But yeah, definitely um, was not wanting to get stuck in anything else, mate. I was um, I was in the fetal position every time I thought about um, you know doing any work or. Uh, or managing any staff or anything like that or you know if the accountant asked me a, a question relating to the previous business I, I kind of shuddered um so yeah i just needed to kind of yeah as people probably understand if they've run businesses before you, you, there is a lot a lot of stress involved and i guess um once it's done and dusted you just want to forget it ever happened for a while i suppose mm, mm. and so you you just took a break for a few years yeah, so just um, played a lot of golf, went to the beach, obviously, a lot, um, just took some time off, um, trade, was still trading, um, and that's probably where I built most of the, um, the data set that I use now, and that's obviously most people don't have that kind of luxury um, to be able to sit around and spend a couple of hours a day on, on that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, just kind of enjoyed myself, mate, you know, took up various strange hobbies and um and you know every week i'd have you know a different couple of things that i'd deep dive into whether it was you know a band or a style of music or a director or an actor or something and i'd just kind of binge on on that for the week um so yeah it was pretty cool to kind of do that and obviously spend pretty much every every uh waking moment with the, the kids when they weren't at school um which you know um fully prepared that in a couple of years they yeah they won't want to know me so that's why I was um yeah I was enjoying kind of doing that um and that's probably the other thing now that I can um go 120 percent at certain things because they're yeah obviously getting a bit older and starting their own yeah starting their own kind of lives and all the rest of it yeah yeah 
No, okay. That's that's really interesting to know that you sort of had that period of success and you, you did take time to, I guess, not bask in it, but enjoy life a bit. And I think that's something that serial entrepreneurs or business business people in their own right maybe forget and neglect to do. There's never a feeling of accomplishment and they're always mm. on to the next thing, never yeah. feel like they're fully satisfied. So I really like hats off to you for taking that time and yeah, enjoying life and doing life with the kids for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and as you know, that's the um, obviously the appeal of, um, you know, trading as a, as a job as well in terms of, um, you know, it does give you that flexibility to kind of live where you want do do what you want um you know i haven't haven't been to other than by my uh by my lovely wife i haven't been told you know what to do and when to do it for you know 12 13 years or something now so and that's just that's just me but um yeah i i couldn't i don't think i could go back to that but um yeah no, no that's um that's really good so then the question is is where where does the the trading fit into all of this is this something you picked up post business something you'd always been interested in since year 11 when you're doing the econo economics what where did this start uh my parents used to do a little mum in particular did a bit of specky uh trading on mining and biotech stocks and things like that so um yeah it just got me interested used to do the, the comsec um what was it or the asx share market game or whatever um i might just take might just uh close out that mate now so that's reached your full expectancy for the day is that right yeah it's getting up there i mean it's probably probably gonna prove me wrong now and keep rallying but um but yeah it's um you can't really complain with a what's that 10 bit over 10 percent return in a day so you know annualize that out mate that'd be a, a not a bad year so oh yeah don't worry about any of the losses <laughs> or anything mate. it's going the other, other way there no, that doesn't happen mate <laughs> no no sorry my bad <laughs> um what were we talking about sorry mate? what was the question so you're now flat uh just to be clear to everyone listening and watching you are what well, we're half an hour into morning trade and you're flat you've captured a 40 50 point move 60 point move really um nearly um the lower the pre-market yeah 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 so you've nearly captured captured a 60 point move for an opening drive long you've got 20 minutes left are you you're gonna worry about tinkering around or are you gonna show some good I'm good gonna, discipline i'm gonna lock that on the leaderboard mate and that that's probably like um yeah one other thing that i'd say in terms of um you know look i've said this before but i think most good traders like one of their traits is you know that contrarian nature and i think that's also a very bad can be a very bad trait in trading in terms of like if you've missed this move all you're trying to do is go against it now because you're trying to prove that you're you know in your mind that you're smarter than everyone and you're going to pick this move back to kind of open or whatever whereas if you look at data and that obviously i'm fortunate enough to kind of have that in front of me but um you know you really you're playing for pennies if you're kind of going against these type of moves a great majority of the time so yeah i mean it it would make me feel um good to try and you know pick a turn around here but um at the end of the day you probably you know to get any type of decent short move back here and it'll probably prove me wrong as we're watching it now but um um you, you know it's probably it's minuscule kind of probability so um yeah so there's no kind of appeal from a um, statistical point of view for me to try and trade that back to me or whatnot. Yeah. And I mean, for me personally, like, I think what will make us such a good uh, duo in terms of co-hosting podcasts and asking, asking guests to come on and, and chat is I'm, I'm obviously a lot more beginner or junior compared to yourself. And I mean, the, the characteristics or the traits you've just described there of trying to go against the grain and, and yeah, pick that move, that contrarian move is something I still struggle with. So yeah, absolutely. it's, yeah. yeah, it's good to learn that. And it'll be good to hear different perspectives from different guests and be able to sort of harness both my sort of more beginner questions and those basic sort of understandings that I have and also overlay that with your more experienced sort of view and, and ask some of 
those more deeper and in-depth questions to those guests and really get both both parts out and and really get value from both of that so yeah yeah no i'm looking forward to that just between you and i yeah yeah so mate just back on trading now you did some sort of share market games uh you said that your mother was very into the into the stock market for a bit there was it something that you did passively throughout your banking hotel management business time or did it just come purely after that yeah i remember um uh we, it was funny in the, the hotel um we had a a bit of a, a all, all the other staff started a bit of a campaign a dm for dm campaign when i first started which was um david martin for duty manager um so okay. um you know i'd take funny pictures with the with dm the, for dm <laughs> I'd go around and take funny pictures with the clients, with you know with the customers, with you know funny glasses on and fake teeth, and and then when the event um, manager came in in the morning, he'd have his desk plastered with these DM for DM photos and all this kind of thing. But um, it, it was probably a high, in hindsight a mistake for them to put me as manager because I spent most of the time you know, in the office um, watching the watching the markets at night. But um, yeah, so it was kind of a yeah a thing that I did. Um, all the way through on and off, I suppose, and then got right back into it just before COVID um, hit, which was probably yeah, good timing. So you were in equities at this point? Uh, no, CFDs, index, yeah, playing around with a couple of, you know, FX and a few things, but yeah, mainly um, indexes, because that's, um, I was following a guy at the time, just getting into, again, back near co the start of COVID, um, who did um, futures? So I was kind of yeah following him. Yeah, yeah. And so you essentially grew that over COVID. You became more and more confident in your data set as time went on, and you built that out. Yeah, COVID was just um, gut. It was all gut. Um, yeah. So again, I was I was following one guy, and he um, nailed it all all through COVID, and that was. Um, yeah, it was obviously a good time to get in, but a bad time as well because I was trading very small contracts at the start because I was just getting back into it. So, you know, if I'd started a couple of months before, I probably would have been trading five times the amount. But, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, COVID was incredible for me. I mean, there was – and it was also because the platforms, um, the brokers kind of didn't really get their risk management in line as quickly as they probably – should have um in terms of like you know for the first month or two you know we'd be gapping at you know 100 200 points i think it was um on a monday morning um so i really? was <clears throat> yeah and i was just going I, I worked out pretty quickly that you could set pretty tight guaranteed stop losses um on the saturday morning so i was kind of just leveraging as much as i could a short position and a long position simultaneously with um, very tight guaranteed stops. So I'd obviously, when it gapped 100 points, you know, on the Monday, I'd obviously lose your 10 on the buy side, but then make, you know, the 100 on the on the sell side. So um, that, was, that was a good time. And yeah, and it was just, you know, it was like 300 points in one direction. You know, it was just, um, it was really, really fun to trade. And um, yeah, so I made, yeah, made a, a lot of money, like I had, Seventy, eighty thousand dollars days, or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars weeks. It was um, for someone who, yeah, had only just started kind of getting back into it. It was, yeah, really, yeah, a really good time to uh, to trade. Yeah, yeah. Wow. No, that's that's interesting. And then I guess the the markets now are not two hundred, three hundred points in one direction, not offering that. So that's when you built out this data set. Is that right? Yeah, exactly, mate. I was um, kind of on the way up. I didn't really, um, I didn't, yeah, I just didn't get it. And I was trading, I was still trading short and I was trading as if it was, you know, those 200 and 300 point days. As you, as you mentioned, I was trading those position sizes and stops and everything as if they were, it was going to go, that, you know, that volatility was there, but it actually wasn't. So, um, you know, I gave, gave most of it back and that's where I kind of, yeah, drew a line in the sand and said, this is not, Kind of good enough, um, you know. Just going, going with my gut, or following someone else who, um, you know, turned out to be a bit 
bit uh, bit dodgy around the edges. So, um, so yeah, that's where I started. You know, as I've said, I had probably fifty A four pieces of paper where I started scribbling, you know, gaps and pre market moves and stuff like that, and just going through the charts and just seeing how one thing affected the other and whatnot. And that kind of yeah started with you know one one or two columns, and now it's kind of yeah expanded into a a goliath so um yeah it's it yeah anybody can obviously get started but it, it yeah it does take obviously a lot of uh effort but paying off now yep yep so just quickly run me through that that spreadsheet now on excel which is your data set for people who are maybe looking at yeah going by the book using numbers rather than chart patterns discretion whatever um else is out there what parameters or what are you essentially capturing within a day that makes up your data set? I mean, there's a lot you can, can look at. Um, yeah, obviously, as I said, the main ones I'd be looking at is the gap, the pre-market, the overnight move. Um, so yeah, yeah, the first thing you got to do, and obviously that's why I kind of started a bit of a foundational substat kind of thing, I suppose, is, to, is, is kind of get your head around how the futures market operates i mean you've obviously got your your physical market which is you know your 200 shares your xjo yeah. and how that that tracks and then you've got the spy contract which is um you know a tradable contract rolling three months that institutions hedge funds super funds etc use to hedge out their equity exposure so that's a derivative of what the xjo uh, is doing um, and then obviously the Oz 200, which we trade for CFDs and whatnot, is a derivative of the SPY. So you kind of got, got to get your head around all of that to, to realize which variables and which time periods are important. So obviously, you know, the, the SPY kind of movements will track what the underlying basket of shares are doing from 10 a.m. to 4, 4 p.m. because that's something real that you can see. You can see wh where the shares are going. Um, so obviously, if um, you know if the, if that basket is moving up, then people are more confident, um, and they'll you know release their insurance, and obviously that means that the spy goes higher. And then overnight, so once that closes at four four o'clock, obviously the next one is twelve, sixteen, whatever, eighteen hours um, is basically people trying to predict where that basket is going to open the next morning, right? So. Um, and that's where futures, I find, um, there's so many kind of, uh, I won't say arbitrage, but um, there's a lot of opportunity for profit um, when you get your hand around that. And particularly when you've got, um, you can view yeah. trends and how humans interact and kind of, uh, you know, trade on different pieces of information because, um, yeah, that 16 hour period is all just speculation. So. Um, there's a lot of periods there where, you know, the market's out of balance with where it, where where those shares will probably open up the next day. Um, so, you know, for instance, if it's a, I don't know, a US data release and it's um, the the US goes one percent higher, um, you know, we'll follow that in the out of hours kind of market, tracking that higher. Um, but it doesn't mean that everyone's going to suddenly go out and bid. 5% over for BHP and, you know, the top 200 the next day on open? Well, probably not. So that <clears throat> that's where it provides some opportunity because if the, obviously, if the futures doesn't kind of price that in um, and the market opens and all the shares open flat, um, it's got to adjust pretty quickly, you know, in terms of like, oh, shit, you know, we're, pricing this as if everything was going to go up 1% and it's open and, and everyone shrugged their shoulders. So, so you know, that's where you get the big falls, you know, the first 15 minutes to an hour, you know, people kind of adapt very quickly to the fact that what they thought was going to happen didn't happen. Um, and that's, yeah, and that's where all the opportunity is. Yeah. Okay. Having just heard how you explain different major moves in the market and interpreting overnight moves to then inform the current day moves and trading within the box of the data that you have. I'm a new trader. 
I like what you've just said. I like that I'm not looking at chart patterns and just hoping that something works in my favor. I like that I can control my risk based on the box that you've, you are able to discern from your data. I'm a new trader. How do I go about building a data set? What are the first steps of building a data set that then allows me to trade similar to how you trade? I would say that, um, you know, I, I, I use this for um, my trading, you know, pretty much 100%, but I encourage people to just use it as a tool um, along with technical analysis, you know, macro analysis, water, and it all comes back to your trading style, you know, your duration of when you're holding trades, all the rest of it. I mean, these are all kind of factors, but yeah, I, I repeatedly say just use my stuff as a, you know, as a tool along with, you know, other tools in your in your arsenal. Um, but yeah, in terms of starting, I mean, obviously I've got, um, you know, premium start, sub stack where I put, you know, this stuff out, but in terms of actually building your own, um, yeah, it's, uh, there's no kind of easier answer. I don't think, I, I think I've said to you in the past, Chugs, I mean, getting the data, um, you know, if you're clever, you can, uh, you know, set up your APIs or whatever to get, to get that data. I don't think that's probably a big issue if you're a, if you're an intelligent person out there, but, um, but that's, I think I've said to you before, like that, in my mind, that's probably 20% of the overall package. And then 40% is knowing how to interpret that data and how to filter that data and what, you know, time periods and variables are important. Um, and that probably just comes with experience. That's, you know, I've been trading for what, 20 something years now. Um, and then, the other 40% is actually making decisions on, you know, making, uh, you know, good executions on that data. So, and, the, and you know, the, that box that you see there, I mean, that's something that I'm still very much working on. Um, and that's where, you know, your psychology, emotional emotions, uh, all that kind of risk reward ratios, all that you know, trading plans, that all comes into it then. Yeah, yeah. What sort of work have you done on building that mental side of of your trading? Those discipline discipline like rule sets, your frameworks around your your mental of a day to day. What what have you done with that to essentially get that to a place where you feel confident in the market? Yeah, good question. I think it's for me. It's all in now. It's all in that data set. Like I don't get excited anymore. I don't get, um, you know, depressed. I don't get anything because it's all there. And and that's you know a bit sad in a way, but it's also good in terms of that I've just got certainty. That's um, you know, I sleep well at night. You know, if I have a losing trade, if I lose money, it's not a big deal to me because I'm looking at the box. I've made a decision based on that. I know it's real hard data. Um, it's not, you know, fluff. Um, so yeah, it's just peace. Now I've got complete kind of peace of mind when I trade. So um, yeah, probably just saw, you know, obviously in today's example, like I wasn't kind of writing every, even though it was a demo account, but I was trading in another account um, with some pretty, pretty decent size, but um, you know, I wasn't right writing every yep. tick um it is what it is what it is it could have dropped you know 25 points in the first few minutes and taken me out and i would have you know i wouldn't be in any different kind of state of mind than i am at the moment yeah okay no that's really interesting you sort of touched a bit on losses there is there a loss that stands out to you in your time trading is there one that you went i've gone done did it this time yeah mate yeah there there was one, um, I think it was January 22 and we were on the Gold Coast and I was kind of feeling pretty good about myself and, you know, I had a good COVID, all the rest of it, you know, living on the beach, just living living the dream. And um, I'd started kind of doing a kind of a Warren Buffett style, uh, you know, buy the index and hold it um, in a CFD account. Uh, you know, and I'd keep adding to it and adding to it. And on, on top of that, I set also um, limit limit buys every 50 or 100 points below the market to, you know, like the whole, as I said, the Warren Buffett markets always go up and in the long run, blah, blah, blah. 
and I probably didn't um, do my maths properly on the, you know, on the position sizing and uh, how much cap capital that I had to uh, to buffer. And uh, yeah, I think it was January, and it was kind of it had already come off ten percent, and I kept buying and buying, and I think I was I forget how many positions, but seven hundred positions or something like that. And it came off a few hundred points, and then yeah, I remember one morning, um, yeah, waking up to a a lot of uh, notifications and SMSs and all the rest of it, uh, and it had fallen. I think that was the night that it fell three hundred points overnight, and and I got stopped out uh, three points from the from the bottom. So they li liquidated me three points from the bottom, and it rallied back one hundred and fifty points or something like that. Um, so I, I still had, I think, a hundred grand capital in in the account, but for whatever reason, their algorithms kicked me out at that point, um, and that was, um, I think, five or six hundred grand. I kind of yeah lost over that short period, which yeah obviously set me back uh, significantly. Um, but yeah, always as I've kind of said, and it might sound a bit strange. I don't know if other people do the same, but. You know, I actually get pretty pumped when that kind of stuff happens. I mean, obviously there was a. Oh, so you were excited when you lost five or six hundred grand. Well, there was obviously you, you were you were out partying. There right? was obviously a period where I kind of sat with head in hands, but um, but yeah, I kind of had that yeah bit bit of excitement once I got past that in terms of like okay, now you're on your own. Like, essentially, I burnt the boats, right? You know the the saying of uh who was it the the spanish inquistadors or whatever that they you know so they so they couldn't go back when they landed wherever they landed they burn all the boats um and it was like yeah I, I kind of got a bit of an exhilaration in a way which might sound a bit bit strange but that you know there was no that was that was it i was you know on my own from that point on and um you know there was there was no no failure from that from then on so but yeah it's interesting like now obviously i've learned learned plenty from that and I, I remember reading after that that um i think it was ray dalio made a comment like you know every every asset class in your lifetime will drop more than 50 percent twice or something like that so when you kind of frame it in that perspective like it was pretty it was pretty stupid um what i was what i did and but um yeah definitely a um pretty decent kind of learning experience yeah yeah but it's important to distinguish there that although uh, oh mate the timer just went off hold that thought that is the end of your one hour trading session that one hour challenge mate that puts you in spot number one am I, am I, I just want to put that there you <laughs> are in spot number one <laughs> the For total number of people that have done this is exactly <laughs> one thing. enjoy the glory while it lasts Yes, I didn't blow up the. I, don't, I think it'd be a bit hard to blow up the account, but um, I'm glad that didn't happen. Yeah, so you spent the last 15 minutes out of position. You had realised your expectancy. It was really good to actually see that you were trading how you would normally trade of a morning. I think that is going to offer a lot of insight to our listeners. Just to recap, you established yourself in pre-market. Pre-market dropped maybe 10 points. It's just shy of 10 points. You got. Yeah, so just, just, just to cut in, mate, um, on that on that pre market. So again, when I looked through <clears throat> those day those, those kind of scenarios that I had before, um, pre market was flat or up every every single time in that those scenarios. So that's why um, you know once it dropped, that was a pretty pretty straightforward kind of decision. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting to know. Essentially, the market rallied or had had a really good drive over the course of our discussion and you talk me through you at the end of your positions when you were closing out you'd reach the expectancy based on your data for the day yeah it was getting i was probably a little bit <clears throat> lazy um given that we were talking but it, yeah it was getting up to work to where i'd probably ex yeah i probably would have spent a bit more time kind of you know drilling into it a little bit um and being a bit more detailed uh, if it was yeah, real life, but um, but yeah, it was you know there's more downside than upside. Yeah, yeah, great. And so you started the challenge an hour ago with twenty thousand dollars. You've been able to amass a whopping two thousand one hundred ninety five dollars profit in an hour, and that 
like I said, put you in position number one on our leaderboard out of one. So congratulations. And uh, yeah, thank you for showing that, that insight. What do I, what if I, what do I win if we, um, if I stay there, man? Do we have a, a you I don't or, uh, to stay there, mate. We've got some good traders. <laughs> No, not that I don't have faith in you. I don't know. We, we might have to um, come up with a prize, like at the end of the year or something like that, or yeah, we'll fifty guests together, in. Mate. Yep. Yeah, I think we a little trophy that'll be that'll be good. Um, a little trophy, maybe, maybe. I don't know. We're gonna have to think. Maybe we should open it up to to listeners. What what we should give the best trader, best hour time frame trader absolutely yeah 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 i think that'll be that'll be really interesting so just quickly back on your data set and the way that you trade now where are you seeing yourself going in your trading in future like if you were to make your trading better what what does that look like um i don't think it looks a great deal different than what i'm doing now to be honest i think i said to you the other day like my my challenge is really around um not con not continually kind of trying to push the envelope and um look for something better and out trying out outsmart myself like a, um i've got a very good kind of strategy and it's all working very well now but um yeah all my kind of losses come from me you know testing out different hypotheses that um you know i really don't have to so um yeah it's probably more about just automating it now in terms of you know the discretionary decisions that i'm making just kind of make them um, a little bit more mechanical um and going from there yeah yeah okay so you sort of have like the i guess your blueprint down for the way you trade mm, yep yeah yeah so then how does that work in with your day? Like what is your morning? What is your, what's your routine in a day to be able to execute successfully and, and feel like you've had a really good day on the market and in life? Like what, yeah. what does that look like? Yeah, mate, I'm one of those annoying people that are up super early and I'm a, you know, 4.30 kind of riser and hit the, hit the pool at five when it opens at the gym and then do a bit of a steam and, whatnot and then normally head head into the office or uh order starbucks to um to do the the sub stack and kind of um you know review the night um and i think that interesting happens and kind of setting up the scenarios for the day and things like that and then i'll go <clears throat> pick the kid uh, grab the kids take them to school uh yeah head in head into the office and kind of play the open for an hour or two um and then normally go to lunch um try and do something um you know, play a bit of golf or do something for a short period and then go pick the kids back up um and then sometimes yeah head head into the office if i'm feeling kind of particularly motivated to um to get some more stuff done at, at night but um yeah i think mate just eat, like i don't you know i again one of those annoying people that you know eats pretty well and uh doesn't eat a great deal and you know exercises and stuff like that. I find that has a has a significant kind of impact on my mental state um like I think I think I said in one of those um those challenges that I did the one day that I kind of lost money was the one day I didn't go to the gym so whether that's a coincidence or not but um yeah I, I think it definitely help has a big hand in um you know making making good decisions and my, I, I, you know I've only got two two shirts so i don't um you know i don't get decision fatigue by having to worry about what sh what shirt or clothes that i have to wear mate you're not mark zuckerberg just between <laughs> that's what you that's what you think mate yeah well you must have a good good uh you know good personality because the wife doesn't get good dress attire she doesn't get any hair to look at so it's it's got to be something on the inside <laughs> it is it's got to be personality 100 <laughs> percent or I'm, I'm just uh, have good physical attributes, yeah. But uh... <laughs> um, <laughs> back on topic, uh, real quick, what do you think of those guys that flash around in Lamborghinis and and you know the nice cars, expensive houses? Do you think there's a place for that in trading? Do you do you look at that and go, obviously, because you've just described a really wholesome 
sort of day you you wake up get wake up early do your day you've got a really wholesome day what do you think of those guys or those traders that do flash around their wealth yeah i don't really have a much of an issue with it like um yeah i suppose if i had a pension for lamborghinis i'd probably be looking to to do the same thing but yeah i, I listened to an interesting kind of uh interview with that tim sykes the other day funny you he actually mentioned that and he he really uses that as um you know inspirate to try and inspire people to kind of hustle and work hard and all the rest of it so i suppose it yeah i think it has a has a place from that point of view but uh, yeah uh, in saying that i know a lot of people just use it for a bit of a wank but um but yeah i guess that if that makes them happy and it's not kind of um you know i suppose if they're leading people astray by um you know having a, a paid service or something like that maybe um there's an issue there but yeah whatever it kind of helps them sleep at night i suppose so then what inspires you to work hard um good question yeah i don't know mate it's um i just love what i do like i'm i'm loving what i'm doing at the moment i, I if i do something i do it 100 you know I, I had three years of sloth that i've got to kind of make up for um when i get that those juices flowing I, I work pretty hard to kind of get it done and yeah mate i love every hour that i have at the moment you know i get to come into the office do something i love listen to uh music for a few hours a day and um yeah and really just enjoy myself and i'm enjoying obviously the journey that you know we're going on through this podcast um and obviously through the Substack as well you know i'm not you know the great the great part of my situation at the moment is that you know i really excuse the french couldn't give a fuck if people like me follow me subscribe to me you know i don't i just really enjoy what i'm doing and i'm enjoying you know helping others um you know just have another tool tool in their kit box for trading you know i've got a passion to you know they say what 90 percent of retail traders lose money like i I don't think it needs to be like that. Um, like there's, yeah, it's just, it's been a real kind of eye opener when you see in black and white that the market can be fairly predictable um, in certain um, situations. And then it's just up to yourself to kind of work on your own discipline and to kind of stick to those, um, you know, those uh, situations and position sizes and all, all that kind of thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm just really enjoying you know if, as you know you know finding a tribe of people that um share similar interests and enjoy what you do and yeah if i can kind of add add something to that then um then yeah have, enjoy it yeah no that's that's a great answer that's really good one last question for you you do a lot of data you obviously have this data set you do a lot of data driven trading where do you see ai fitting in in the market in the next two years, three years, what does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to be huge in every uh, perspective. You know, I'm churning out, you know, ten times the amount of work that I would have been able to do a year sure. ago. Uh, yeah, and I actually, yeah. I actually put a few things on hold a year ago when I was going to start them because um, because I just saw the the pace that AI, you know, whether it's you know dali or chat gpt or whatever i saw the pace that it was kind of um improving and so i didn't really want to be wasting time then that i knew would take you know a quarter of the time now so um yeah i mean i think you're going to get left left behind if you don't use it in some way shape or fo form um you know i'm not a i'm not, not a great coder or anything like that i'm trying to learn the basics but i definitely think that's something as a if you're a new trader to to have a look at um but yeah i think in, i think if we come back in a year's time we're going to be talking about some pretty impressive um tools that traders can kind of use and yeah and i guess that's what i'm i'm trying to be part of that as well in what i'm developing with this data set and um you know potentially a platform and whatnot for for retail traders in the next 12 months and things like that so yeah i think there's a, a lot that's going to put um you know some power back into the into the hand and that i guess that's the 
you know, the mission of the TGM um, insights that I'm doing is like democratizing that data set for retail traders, because I, I think most of that power is in the hands of, you know, you know high frequency trading and um, the large institutions at the moment. So yeah, if we can kind of, you're never going to be on, on a level playing field, but if, um, yeah, if we can get kind of close to it, I think that'd be a, a really good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, that was a great answer and a great way, I think, to to wrap us up here. So thank you very much for sharing your, your insights and, and your journey and obviously tra trading and setting setting the bar for, for guests to to come. So, but I mean, you're not going anywhere. You are a co-host, so. No, yeah, you're... I think it, you're turning the tables next time. Yeah, so I'll be on the, the I'll be receiving. Um, on the receiving for, end, yeah, that sounds. Yeah, yeah, so I, I don't quite have the the complete story arc yet. I'm sort of, I'm still struggling there, but I mean, it'll be good to good to chat through that when we get to it. So, yeah, and you'll be yeah. trading uh, what wheat futures or? Uh, I'm an orange juice guy, actually. Orange juice, all right. Yeah, yeah. Short, short so, it. Mate. Short it. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, thanks, Joe. That was, that was really good, mate. I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if if the people who are listening and viewing at home did enjoy it, please make sure you you subscribe, like, um, leave a rating on on the podcast services because that sort of shows us that we're doing the right thing, and it also shows those algorithms um, that we are on the right track and you want to hear and see more. So if you could do that, that'd be yeah, really, really appreciated, especially in these early days. Yeah, absolutely. Easy. Well, until our next podcast, Marto, uh, keep trading like you did this morning and we'll <laughs> chat soon, hey? <laughs> Will do, buddy. Thanks, mate. All right. Thanks. Cheers, mate.